Now, hello, this is Christopher Sabin from Owen Age Consulting. I wanted to begin the uh, third and final installment of this uh, three-part series on children with optic nerve hypoplasia and educational strategies. And I wanted to just recap what I was uh, uh, discussing earlier, what I had discussed earlier about behaviors and uh, the types of sensory processing disorder, which uh, I, I did discuss in, in some detail, but didn't complete my entire discussion, uh, as well as uh, some of the behavioral characteristics of children with optic nerve hypoplasia. Uh, I'm going to discuss also very briefly some of the strengths or some of the unique abilities of children with optic nerve hypoplasia. I'm going to discuss educational strategies for use in the school curriculum in the community and also for families. And I'm going to conclude with perhaps the most important part of this entire workshop series for many of you, and that involves behavior management strategies. And uh, that is something that is, when I do workshops, typically something that I get asked most about, especially uh, some of the strategies I use to manage my own behaviors and some of the resources and some of the things that uh, have worked for me. Some of these behavior management, some of these strategies may not work directly for a lot of our kids, but many of them have worked for me. Uh, do understand though, that our kids are very different. You have kids who are not as much impacted behaviorally, but you also have kids that are more, beha more behaviorally impacted than I was. So uh, to discuss the earlier workshop, I was talking about sensory processing disorders. And I, as I mentioned, there are actually eight senses. When we look at sensory processing, it has to do basically with how our brain processes information that it perceives or, or that it comes into it from the senses. In optic nerve hypoplasia, what you have is, you know, essentially the, the neurons that feed from the optic nerve from the back of the eye, the retina to the optic nerve of the brain, a lot of those neurons did not develop properly or at all. And so you have essentially a telecommunication system with equipment that is missing, there are wires missing, you may have entire office switches in, in a telephone network missing. Uh, this is, goes back to a metaphor that I used earlier in installment one, in my first installment, where essentially I referred to the optic nerve and the brain is a giant telephone network. And when, when that happens, you have essentially difficulty in the body's ability to process information that comes into it through its senses. A lot of kids with O1H have sensory processing disorders. And so we, when we think of sensory processing disorders, as I mentioned earlier, it involves much more than just five senses. You have, uh, of course, the typical five senses, such as uh, sight, such as smell, such as seeing, taste, and touch. However, when we talk about sensory processing disorders, there are three additional senses at play. The first sense is what is referred to as the vestibular sense, V-E-S-T-I-B-U-L-A-R. It has to do with the vestibular system in the, in the inner ears, ultimately. And the vestibular sense is the body's ability to maintain balance and maintain equilibrium. And when a child has a de has a, a glitch or a difficulty or a difference in the way that they process information with uh, the vestibular sense, they have difficulty, such as me, with coordination of many basic activities. That can either mean gross motor. You know, typically, when therapists uh, look at vestibular sense in the more than in the typical sense, they look at athletes who can't coordinate or, or, or kids who have had difficulty with sports or, or kids that, that are clumsy or awkward or uncoordinated. Uh, they may have difficulty with motor movements. They may have difficulty with gait uh, and so on and so forth. They tend to be really uncoordinated. However, in our context, 
vestibular sense can wreak havoc with a lot of very basic life functions, including walking. I per uh, personally did not learn to walk unsupported until I was 20 months old. And a lot of kids have difficulty with uh, moving up and down stairs. They may need walkers. They may need ambulatory devices well into their childhood. Uh, I know of a young man right now who uh, I work with in the past who had difficulty uh, walking uh, coordinating one foot in front of another walking upstairs. He had to walk basically just one step and then another step and another step with one foot. So it took him a long time to get up and up and down stairs because he couldn't coordinate his right and his left foot together to walk upstairs efficiently until he was nine years old. And of course, one day he decided that he had the resources, that he had the wherewithal, he had the ability to process putting one foot in front of the other to walk upstairs, and he suddenly started to perform these activities independently. And you'll find this, as I mentioned earlier, is very typical for a lot of our kids, and one thing that they're able to, they're unable to perform a given task one day, and they're suddenly able to perform that task the next day. But it takes a significant amount of training and simulation in order to allow our kids to achieve their skills I discussed earlier. The the second sense that I wanted to discuss is referred to as pro proprioception. The spelling of that, of course, is P-R-O-P-R-O-P-R-I-O-C-E-P-T-I-O-N, -O -P -P -E proprioception. And proprioception comes from the Latin word from a Latin term meaning to take one's own. And it has to do with the body's ability to understand or to interpret where it is in space and how the parts of the body interact to form a big picture of where the body is and to coordinate complex movements such as, you know, when you think of Proprioception, you, you think of, of uh, dribbling a basketball, shooting a three throw in, in basketball, hitting a fastball, for example. You know, some you know, professional athletes are typically, as I say, experts at proprioception because they're able to coordinate uh, the various uh, uh, parts of their body, various activities, or what have you, to perform given tasks. You, know, you you look at dances uh, such as uh, the tango, such as the moonwalk, for example, are involve a lot of proprioception, a lot of proprioceptive skills. And kids that have sensory processing disorder, that ability is it is 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 lacking or, or did not develop fully. And so you have kids that are, in my case, for example, have difficulty coordinating their their hands. Their, their right and their left hands sufficiently so that they can code letters on a braille page. They can read braille, which is really takes a lot of skill and it takes a lot of resources cognitively and, and, and tactually when you think about it because you have to be able to coordinate very rough, uh, rough feeling, rough textured letters on a page and be able to interpret that, be able to code those pieces uh, of dots on a page as letters and signs and, and whole words in many cases. So learning Braille for me and, and many other kids it can be very difficult because of, 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 of difficulties in, in that particular sense. The third sensory, the third sense, uh, the eight senses uh, that our body has is interoception the spelling of that is intero, I-N-T-E-R-R-O-C-E-P-T-I-O-N, interoception. And it is the body's ability to take all of the information that it gets from all of the body's other senses. And that includes the basic five, but it also includes the proprioceptive, proprioceptive sense and the vestibular sense, proprioception and the vestibular sense. And coordinated into one huge whole, into one integrated, comprehensive whole so that the body can and understand what is truly going on in its environment.
And there are only two activities that involve all the use of all eight senses. And one of the most important activities of the two is, well, both of them are very important, but the one I want to talk about most directly is eating, is food intake, because a lot of our kids have extreme food preferences. There are cases, even to this day, where I oftentimes just don't feel like processing food. When I do a presentation, when I have a really rough day, you know, there's some stuff going on at home, there, there's a, you know, a difficulty with clients or what have you, there are some times when, you know, if, if the food isn't something that I really like or, or can process, I would just say, well, it's just I'm not hungry and can, you know, in some, time, in some cases just go 24 hours without eating because, you know, I, I love you, but I just can't really process this food at this time. And I'd rather go back and I'd rather sit back and read or watch TV or, or uh, send emails or, or work on other projects instead of, of eating. Because to be honest with you, it is easier to process work than sometimes certain foods. Uh, in my case, I had food aversions. I had uh, texture aversions to bananas. There are certain foods to this day, such as Sloppy Joe's, I just cannot tolerate. Uh, when I was two years old, all I remember eating was uh, was uh, ice cream, uh, a gratin potatoes, uh, French fries, uh, Pepsi. I, I would put it was all, pretty much all I could drink for all I really could tolerate drinking for years and years and years. And, and my my mom would think I was a bad mother. Be, she was a bad mother because. You know, she was constantly giving me uh, Pepsi as opposed to fruit juice or, or water or, or healthier drinks. And it really made her feel like a bad person because it got to the point where for a long time, it kind of still is, and even even as an adult in certain cases, where it, it it's pretty much, it, if I'll eat it, even if it's maybe perceived as junk food or, or what have you, uh, she'll she'll give it to me because she'll know because she knows that at at certain times or not all the time that's pretty much all I can process, and that makes things particularly difficult for our kids because 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 it's the hypothalamic dysfunction pituitary dysfunction. One of the issues that comes along with that is obesity. You know there are a, there is a subset of our kids that are morbidly obese, and of course we uh, typically think of children that you that, that that eat an excessive amount of junk food as uh, having is uh, uh, relating to the obesity epidemic. But unfortunately, with our kids, there are cases where uh, w without dietary supplements or, or other types of interventions, support from a nutritionist. Uh, junk food may be the only thing that we can tolerate, the only food that we can tolerate at a given point with, without specific dietary interventions involved. And you may find that to be the case with a lot of uh, a lot of ONH characteristics, as I'll discuss uh, later on with behaviors. Uh, I'm also going to discuss, of course, uh, the uh, types of sensory processing disorder, which I did get into, I did touch on earlier. Uh, the first one being uh, sensory modulation disorder. Uh, sensory modulation disorder is the inability of the brain or the inability of the central nervous system to effectively modulate or uh, or, or process or, or understand uh, the what what level of stimulus to apply to a certain activity. And when I think of, of a sensory modulation disorder, I think typically uh, uh, we have kids that don't understand that they may be applying too much pressure when they're trying to write to a print uh, to a uh, to a pencil. So when they try to write, instead of, of applying light pressure or light touch, they may apply too much pressure. Uh, it, it, a sensory modulation disorder can also affect braille because you know sometimes i find that there are typically people who are typically blind children who have been able to process braille for a number of years you know, typically they find that a the way to process braille is easier to read braille if they uh, 
apply a light touch or, or minimal touch to their fingers as they're reading the braille characters, as they're tracking the movements of their fingers from one line to the next on a braille page. As they're, te they're, keeping a tra they're keeping track adequately of their, uh, their, their hand's position on each line so that they can increase the efficiency and the speed of their reading in braille, which can be very critical in a lot of applications to, to blind children. Whereas uh, a kid with sensory modulation disorder can have significant difficulty with, uh, they may apply too much pressure. They, they may have difficulty understanding that if they apply too much pressure on a braille page, they may have, uh, it may be impossible for them to read efficiently. Uh, and they may not even realize that you're putting too much pressure on a braille page. And, and with sensory modulation disorder, you, you typically have uh, several subtypes, three subtypes of sensory modulation disorder. Uh, the, the first subtype of modulation disorder is referred to as uh, sensory seeking, which is they, or, or sensory under-responsiveness, which is the, well, basically your, your brain doesn't process information uh, adequately, it, it, it's under-responsive. It, it doesn't respond adequately or doesn't respond enough. And kids who have trouble with sensory under-responsivity, they may have extremely high pain tolerance. They might not understand that when they put their hand to a hot stove that it can be physically, it, it can burn your hand, it, it can damage your skin because they don't perceive what the ability to, they, they don't perceive that fire is hot or they don't perceive heat in a, a conventional way or in a, uh, in a proper way or an adaptive way. So they, are, they may be, they may have difficulty with bolting. I have a kid, I, I work with a kid out west, out, out in California who bolted, had a meltdown, had a behavioral meltdown in the middle of recess and, and bolted from where she was, actually left school grounds, was barely a clue of, of what she was doing and she ran something like a mile away from school, almost just about made it home, just about made it home to where she lived because she was that overstimulated and she was that upset, had a meltdown and unfortunately in that case it was a large urban public school setting out in California. Uh, the authority, the aides, the educational staff the school resource officers that were tasked to take care of her essentially were not manned the ship. They had no clue that she had bolted, that she had run off the school property in run of recess, and it created a significant issue for the school. And unfortunately, that that is unfortunate. I digress by mentioning that, but that is sort of an extreme case of sensory under responsivity. The second type of sensory modulation disorder is sensory over responsivity, uh, sensory over responsivity, which is what I deal with constantly, and that is uh, the, the brain is constantly overstimulated. They're constantly over vigilant. You know, in my case, if somebody just touches me the wrong way, or I run or, or you know bump my head on something, which is uh, I I uh, I will even to this day react very violently or, or, or have an overreaction. You know, I, I may be, uh, you're blind, you don't deserve to be here, you shouldn't have done that. And I, I will get very, uh, try, to, try to avoid that obviously in public, but uh, you know, it, it has created some really significant uh, embarrassment. And you know, honestly, this is something that is, is a, a modulation issue that I still deal with this uh, to this day. Uh, it, it, as far as sensory over-responsivity, I, I, I tend to be extremely over-responsive personally uh, in a lot of areas. Yelp, I mean, just just, you know, just basically uh, have, have a physical response to even in some cases if, if somebody touches me without without uh, being uh, with, without. Uh, you know, they don't tell me in advance or, or if I'm unaware of it, I, I can have a reaction that's just way over the top. And I will tell you, I'm aware of it even to this day, uh, but it still doesn't make it socially appropriate. And it is, uh, 
an issue with sensory processing, I've considered looking into occupational therapy. There are some sites locally. Uh, probably we'll, we'll need to do that at some point, but that is an example of how I deal, how I still deal with sensory over-responsivity. Another type of sensory over-responsivity is uh, an example of social uh, of sensory over responsivity is kids with O and H who have extreme sensitivity to loud noises. They may scream. They may go into a meltdown if uh, they're exposed to high frequencies you know, or any kind of noise, such as a, the 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 sound of a police car or the sound of a specific car uh, going down a road. It could be a half a mile away. And extreme cases of that is is referred to as hyperacusis, where you know the, the kid is so upset, they their their hearing is so sensitive that they really can't they they can't deal with even basic stimuli such as you know a, a car horn for example or a car alarm or you know the sound of a car going down the street or a particular signal. Uh, from a TV broadcast or a person's voice, for example, in a lot of cases it can trigger. A lot of cases, uh, certain phonemes, uh, use of certain words can trigger it, and it can be extremely difficult for uh, children to, uh, for, for a, an adult to really manage because the kid is constantly screaming, or, or they're constantly overstimulated, and they may scream or, or, or bang their heads or engage in other types of, of socially inappropriate or self-injurious behaviors because they're responding that they're just that sensitive and they're just that over-responsive and in, in many cases uh, I have recommended that people have their kids have noise canceling headphones or receive auditory integration therapy for uh, uh, these types of, of support or speak and also affect your speech and language if your your process your processing speech is haphazard or, or quirky or, or different or disturbed, you know, call a spade a spade. It can't be disturbed in many cases. So that that is an example of the uh, sensory modulation disorder. The second type of sensory integration or sensory processing difficulty we can experience is referred to as sensory discrimination disorder. And that basically involves looking at, that basically involves the ability to discriminate between one or more objects. I have a kid right now that is unable to understand or unable to process shapes to the extent that he can't discriminate shapes on a braille page. So they have actually. He was in several different. This this guy, this little guy, was actually in uh, a couple of different placements because the families had to move to move around because of uh, uh, one of the parents works in a job that requires constant travel and constant moving. So he's been in three different districts in three years, and the one district actually decided that he that they would not provide any braille instruction because when they did a learning media assessment. There was actually an assessment that TVI's teachers are visually impaired do, actually a number of assessments that involve free braille, that involve, that involve a, a child's ability to recognize a circle versus a triangle, a big versus small, what have you, that are, uh, that, that are prerequisites essentially to being able to understand or process braille characters on a page. Uh, this kid was unable to process or tolerate those types of, of testing and, and, and those, those shapes and was unable to discriminate. So he was essentially, he's unable to deal with Braille and he's also has nonverbal and some other communication needs. But that is an example, put up an extreme example of sensory discrimination disorder. Being able to understand pressure on a pencil, for example, uh, I mentioned that when I was discussing uh, sensory modulation earlier. I will tell you that that fits into sensory modulation in many cases, but the idea of a, a child not being able to uh, understand how much pressure to apply to a pencil, most 
therapist would put that in the category of sensory discrimination disorder as opposed to modulation, even though I think the two overlap, because it has to do with being able to determine the how a an object feels uh, or, or a different type of object feels uh, from one setting to a next, or how your actions impact your uh, the 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 shape or, or the texture or the how it feels or how your body processes that object. I have a kid actually had a, a child I was working with that had this difficulty to such an extent that she she was a screamer. She used to use a lot of vocalizations to uh, to self stimulate, and she actually wore nodules on her vocal cords from screaming so much because she couldn't understand or really didn't didn't have the concept of how loud was too loud. And the screaming, the, the stimulation that she got vocally was, was uh, very soothing. She required that, uh, that type of input because she was sensorily under-responsive, as I discussed earlier. Uh, the third type of sensory processing disorder that I will discuss, and, and, and I, I dealt with really all of these, uh, both of these, so I can relate to this completely, is referred to as sensory motor disorder. And there are two types of sensory motor disorder. The first is referred to as apraxia. It is from the Greek word meaning a, meaning not, and praxia meaning doing. It's where we get the word practical or or, or practice, for example. The, uh, the the word praxia, praxis, relates to uh, those words in English. So, a praxia, basically all it means, it's a fancy Greek term for not doing. You, you can't do it. You, you can't do this. A meaning not, meaning can't, and praxia meaning do. An apraxia is the ability to perform tasks using the coordination of the senses. And, and that has been the bane of my existence. That, that is probably, throughout my childhood and into adulthood, probably the most difficult part of growing up was often nerve hyperplasia, besides behaviors, besides, you know, the, the constant fatigue and, and, and the constant... Uh, you know, you, your brain, you, you, you feel like you have a 747 chugging along in, in the back of your head pretty much constantly, is apraxia. Being able to tie my shoe, being able to button, being able to use a knife and fork, being able to perform household, uh, household tasks, or indeed tolerate being able to perform household tasks has been very, very difficult. It, 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 has, it, it requires a tremendous amount of di discipline. I'm not saying that it is impossible. I'm not saying that I can't do these things, but it, it was a rough road teaching me all of these skills, including the, my mother, who should probably be uh, canonized, she probably should be made a saint. Uh, three years of programming in a center for the blind here in Cincinnati where I operate, eight years occupational therapy, uh, eight years of occupational therapy, speech therapy, communication, just the entire spectrum of everybody from my family, extended family, my mom and, and resources throughout the city where I live, throughout Cincinnati being involved. Uh, it had been involved because of apraxia, because of difficulty with learning very basic skills. And, and Braille fits into that as well, because, let's face it, when you read a letter such as The Cat in the Hat, for example, the title of The Cat, which is the, which is uh, dot, uh, dot two, three, four, six in Braille, for example, for the, and then cat, which is, of course, dot one four, for those of you who are familiar with Braille, and then dot one for, uh, for C, dot one for the letter A, dot two, three, four, five for uh, the letter T for the cat, and so forth. It, it, it requires a lot of being able to process one letter and a set of, of Braille dots on a page and form that into a shape, form that into a whole. And that involves practice, that involves doing, that involves a lot of coordination 
between the uh, the, the tactile sense, your sense of touch, and your uh, higher order functions that uh, involve reading, that in, in allow you to recognize one letter from an next and, and encode uh, cognitively uh, one uh, one word, uh, one letter, uh, and another letter, and another letter, and that combination makes a word. And typically when you are, of course, when you're sighted and many blind people, I've actually learned this with Braille, fortunately, over time, you know, obviously you don't perceive uh, one letter from an extra letter by letter. You typically, of course, perceive whole words and that's how people read. But that involves praxia and, and that involves praxis and that can be very difficult. Visual efficiency can be very difficult uh, with, with somebody with apraxia. Uh, typically, that when therapists, when occupational therapists, in, in more of a typical sense, thinks of of, of apraxia, they think of, of a kid that is uncoordinated, that can't, uh, for example, coordinate activities to uh, throw a fastball or, or throw a changeup in baseball or uh, skating, for example, or, or, or catch a ball appropriately, sporting activities appropriately, because they can't coordinate their body to to handle or, or, or to uh, engage activities. I mentioned my last talk, my the last section, uh, uh, la the second installment of my presentation uh, several weeks ago. Yeah, I, I used to wonder how uh, how break how a child could break dance. You know, break dancing was really popular in the eighties. You know, just just all the activity, just just all the coordination. It's like, how do you do that? And it was really difficult because that was such a challenge for me. And as I'll discuss er later on when I discuss behaviors, even the ability to coordinate my body so I wasn't rocking and flapping my hand all over the place, you know, I, I used to wonder, well, geez, how can other kids you know, stay still all the time? Because I needed the stimulation from that behavior. So we discussed uh, this, we uh, spent probably much more time than uh, you would care to uh, look at or, or spent looking at this material or, or uh, reading or, or watching this YouTube video on the types of sensory processing disorder. And uh, th these, I'm mentioning this, I'm discussing all of this, even though I discussed this in my last uh, talk because it is absolutely critical part of how children can process information through their senses and how these processes can go awry. I want to discuss very briefly, before I go on to educational and behavioral strategies, how some of the different characteristics such as uh, difficulty with speech, difficulty with language, your difficulty with being able to do a lot of behavior, a lot of very basic skills, uh, these types of characteristics can also come with a lot of strengths. Our body, our, our brains have a, a tremendous way of adapting to different stimuli. And a lot of kids, despite a lot of limitations, a lot of disabilities or, or differences in their ability or delays in speech and language and fine motor and gross motor skills and what have you, there are areas in, in a lot of cases, little islands of genius or little islands of innate ability or, or developed ability that can occur in children with O&H or autism spectrum or, or some children with who are also blind or visually impaired. These are sometimes referred to as, as savant skills. Children that had the, and adults that had these abilities are sometimes referred to as savants. Uh, historically, the term idiosavant it has been used to describe children that have extreme abilities in music or calendar calculating or uh, those types of abilities. Uh, uh, chess, for example, you know, there, there are savants in chess. I typically do not like that term, savant. It, first of all, it is a pejorative term. It is actually a French term that is used to describe people who are uh, it have, have intellectual disabilities. It had to do with mental retardation, which is a concept that we do not use anymore. It is a concept that had to do with institutionalization. I do use it for convenience sake because that is a term that is used uh, even savant skills or is a, is, a, is a term that people are familiar with. 
I typically use a term which is my own term. I refer to a sense as specialized innate skills or innate specialized skills to refer to children with, with these types of, of abilities, which a lot of kids with one age have, and they can be very important. They can be very uh, necessary in many cases to uh, helping a child learn and uh, being able to teach or, or get through or, or to help a child process. Uh, in, in my case, I had a lot of musical abilities growing up. I actually taught myself how to play the piano at one point. Lost a skill when I started first grade uh, for a couple of reasons. There were a few reasons that I believe were related to that. It had to do with being in a more typical environment. I was in mainstream school, uh, mainstream elementary school. I also, because my interest at the time, it still kind of is, is a telephone system. I still find myself looking at very occasionally uh, archives, uh, historical archives from the telephone system of the 70s and 80s growing up. Uh, I knew every area code in the United States prior to 1995. I know every state, what zip codes that are in each state. I can tell you, for example, in, in many cases, that the first three digits of a zip code, what state it's in, and in most cases, what part of the state that it is in, in the United States. Uh, I'm very good with geography, can basically have been described as a human GPS or a human, uh, I have the ability to multiply three digit times three digit numbers inside of my head. I, I have numerical abilities, which is kind of unusual in O&H. A lot of our kids have dyscapulia or, or math disorders or need accommodations in math because of sensory processing or perceptual difficulties or, or what have you that sort of go on hand in hand but with someone age but that is actually not the case with me i know of a lot of kids with musical abilities that i know of a a few people that are concert pianists one in particular out of boston who graduated from berkeley school of music who is a uh, a singer and he does the violin, he plays the violin, he's also a concert level pianist. He, he does he does engagements throughout the United States and he sends them international engagements as well. But part of the challenge there is he is also on the autism spectrum. He has a lot of the behaviors that we would typically consider uh, O1H and he is uh, not typical. He requires support in a lot of very basic areas of daily living and it, it is involved in these supportive living uh, because of some other health issues that are involved. And that is the case actually with a lot of, of, of the kids with the specialized in hate skills. It, it, even in my case, the, it, that the, uh, the ability kids with the more pronounced abilities or, or the uh, the, the ability to practice, typically they tend to have more disabilities in more basic areas such as dressing, such as grooming, such as uh, speech and language and, and the uh, daily adaptive stuff that goes pretty much uh, uh, along with uh, activities of, of, of just living in, in society, essentially. I'm going to finish, uh, complete this last part, uh, the, the, the second to last part of my presentation before I go into strategies just, just to just by reiterating that these are these are all characteristics that many children with optic nerve hypoplasia have not all children with ONH have these characteristics everything from sensory processing or the innate skills or, or the uh, savant skills, if you will, or, uh, or or behaviors or speech and language delays, or as I discussed earlier, a lot of the obsessional tendencies, a lot of the musical areas of interest or autism characteristics. But these are behaviors and these are characteristics that you need to, as an educator, as a family member, as someone in a community that is working every day, with a child with own age, you need to be aware of and you need to be able to capitalize or, or accommodate or, or work with a lot of these characteristics. And with that being said, I want to 
begin the final portion of my presentation, which has to do with educational strategies and behavior management strategies. Uh, children with optic neuropathyplasia, as you can imagine from just all the time I've discussed of, of different characteristics, so far we've spent uh, over three hours talking about different characteristics, be it medical, be it uh, uh, developmental, be it psychosocial, can require a lot of a wide variety of strategies to be able to learn successfully and, and achieve their goals, be it in a community, be it as far as their individualized education plan, or be it vocationally if they're in a transition program. Uh, they may require occupational therapy, speech therapy, augmentative communication, augmentative and alternative communication devices, and, and support to be able to function or be able to learn a lot of adaptive skills. They may require support from autism professionals, such as such as uh, applied behavior and uh, applied behavior analysis. Typically, I found that kids don't do as well with ONH with uh, applied behavior analysis or, or some of the more typical interventions you would associate with autism. But ABA, the autism and autism interventions do work in some kids, particularly if they're more involved or, or medically involved, just from my observations, what I've seen of kids in the autism spectrum. And these are, are the kinds of things that occur in addition to the typical blindness services that kids uh, typically need, such as vision services, such as your Braille, such as your uh, adaptive, your adapt skills of daily living, uh, AD, what are referred to, used to be referred to as adaptive ADLs, uh, adapted daily living skills, activities of daily living that blind children have to learn. Typically sighted children or typically developed children pick up as a, just a matter of course, just, just by osmosis. But a lot of us and, and indeed a lot of blind children don't pick up on these skills because they can't see, obviously they can't see what other people are doing. They can't see what their peers are doing. They can't see what mom and dad is doing. They can't see what their cousin is doing. They can't see, they can't learn from activities that uh, they, they see on TV for better or worse, for better or for worse. So they have to be taught a lot of very basic skills, how to go to the bathroom, how to interact appropriately, that, that it's not appropriate to rock or flap your hands or uh, call somebody names or, or bite or, or hit people. You know, these are skills that a lot of blind children have to be taught specifically. I had to be taught very, very specifically about these skills. And actually, in, in my case, because of the trouble I had or, or the difficulty I had with self-regulation, a lot of difficulty with self-regulation, as I'll get into, I actually had to end it up developing my own rules and my own constitution in order to understand or in order to force myself to process or, or to interact appropriately. And that constitution had, has, I'd like to use in the present tense here, uh, different articles. They were numbered. They had different dates that were associated with the, uh, the, the passage of, of different articles in this constitution. I also had acts. I also had, uh, uh, regulations that basically acted like pieces of legislation and had names and dates in many cases, precedents that I use and, and still use to control my behavior. I don't discuss these. I don't talk about these. I don't constantly mention them. I used to. I don't constantly mention them on a daily basis. But that doesn't mean I don't have them and that doesn't mean I don't refer to them. Uh, more than occasionally in my own in, internal dialogue, my, myself personally. And in, in a blindness context, we have what's referred to as the expanded core curriculum that discusses uh, not just the academics, but also uh, behaviors, also daily living skills. And one of, of the more important 
Hearts are the expanded core curriculum for blind and visually impaired self-determination, which is the ability of a child to make their own decisions uh, about their lives, which is something that it, it is absolutely critical. And self-determination is kind of a, 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 a sort of a sticky wicket because uh, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll make decisions because, oh, geez, I'm, I'm interested in Aretha Franklin or I'm interested in you know, Gwen Stefani or, or, or someplace like that or Imagine Dragons because that's my area of interest or, 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 a, given, uh, or a given toy or a given set of communications. But it may, but that, that kind of interest may not be realistic for that child. It may not be even appropriate to pursue areas of, of interest in, in a lot of cases. It certainly wasn't the case in, in my context. So uh, one of the things that I typically refer to, to just just from the just from the get go, in terms of teaching a child with O and H, is uh, you you have to remember what I refer to as the CCR of optic nerve hyperplasia, and CCR refers to consist consistency, context, and repetition. The first C is consistency. Children with optic nerve hyperplasia, a lot of our kids, and again, I can't say all of our kids, but a lot of us, do not generalize. We constantly need, be it extended family members, be it family members, be it teachers, be it uh, division teachers, the orientation mobility, the travel instructor, uh, is there a speech language pathologist involved, there's a speech teacher, regular classroom teacher to Everybody else, uh, bus drivers, custodians at school, the uh, the, the, the local, the cashier at, at Kroger's, the cashier at the local grocery store, Albertsons, or you know whatever the major grocery store chain is, uh, Stop and Shop, need to be, if if possible, on the same page when it comes to communicating with that child. They need to be con entirely consistent. If they're learning a certain skill, like how to say hello and goodbye, how to say please and thank you, which was a big issue when I was in for, uh, fourth and fifth grade, it was Kurt, it was, I, I would not say please, I would not say thank you. That needs to be constantly reinforced because you know what? We do not generalize. Oftentimes you can take a basic skill such as saying please or saying thank you or you know, saying hello and goodbye or, or any number of skills be it a fine motor task such as shoe tying, be it an academic skill, being it, uh, learning to do basic addition, basic subtraction, being able to read, being able to tolerate certain foods at home, that can be extremely context specific. We may do it at home, we may do it at grandma's house, we may do it at cousin Vinny's house, we may do it at what have you, but we can be extremely resistant to performing that very same activity in a school setting, at school, in a school cafeteria, or in a school classroom, or in a pull-out setting, or most importantly, in a restaurant, or in a, a community context, for example, when you're ordering food. And that, that's a huge issue for a lot of kids because, you know, let's face it, school, school cafeterias, grocery stores, restaurants, you know, out in the community, going to the local amusement park can be absolutely mind-numbingly stimulating for a lot of our kids. There's usually a lot of noise. It's usually unfamiliar surroundings. There's variations of routine. Uh, a doesn't always lead to B, doesn't always lead to C. You, you don't have preferred music. People, are, you, you can't, if you're a kid with someone age, you can't always predict what's going on. You don't know your expectations. You don't know what's uh, you don't know what's expected of you. So you're constantly in a situation where you, you're you're not you're not very secure. You're you're just constantly in, in, in tizzy essentially, and yeah, and a lot of kids our our kids have have uh, difficulty processing, and they may go into meltdown. And as I discussed personally, you know, that, that was a real battle. Those types of things were a huge battle, just controlling my own behaviors, as, as I'll discuss in a minute here. Uh, the, uh, the second 
C, as I mentioned, it is relates to consistency as context. A lot of our skill, a lot of kids learn in very context specific ways. So a, a particular teacher, having a particular teacher there or a particular situation or particular environment that child is familiar with or that child feels most secure, that can be absolutely important. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, skills that we have or, or skills can be very context dependent. They can almost be state dependent. Uh, the, the third R in, in the CCR of ONH is repetition. Repetition is absolutely important. You need to be constantly reinforcing one skill to another. I mean, you, you need to be reinforcing the same skills from one context, from one environment to another. Uh, when when Miss Clay, who's an aide, for example, when you when uh, you ask her for a uh, something, or or you stop at the same gro you go to the grocery store and you ask for candy, or you ask for a treat, or something like that, or you go or or, or another child or a peer, or somebody who is a, a kid your own age, gives you something, you can you say thank you when you ask for something. You say you, you say please. It is the courteous thing to do, be it you know, be it on the bus to school, be it with mom and dad, be it at the grocery store, be it at the amusement park, be it at be be it in a classroom setting, be it a playground at recess. You know all of these skills, uh, the please and, and thank you rule applies in all contexts. And that's a huge area that a lot of our kids, blind children, other blind children have difficulty with this area too, but especially our kids, when there's blindness and there's autism characteristics and, and so forth involved, generalizing that please and thank you among so many other rules from one situation to the next can be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for a lot of our kids to accommodate or to accomplish without specific interventions that aren't necessarily blindness related that come from the autism category or, or autism spectrum. And the, this is typically areas that I've experienced that we're just now beginning to, as professionals, understand that some kids who are blind or visually impaired need support from other disciplines such as uh, speech language, such as uh, the autism spectrum or developmental disabilities to achieve daily living skills, educational skills, social skills, pre-vocational skills. The list goes on and on in terms of the kind of support that a child needs to essentially function in a typically developed, sighted, non-developmentally non non disabled world to the maximum extent possible. Very specific uh, interventions that can benefit a lot of our kids and a lot of our kids need. I, I mentioned uh, augmentative communication. I mentioned assistive technology and that can include you know, your, uh, your, your learning media assessment, your, your talking books, your, your braille, Slate and style and so all, all that other good stuff that typically developed blind children use. But there are a number of, or several interventions that work particularly for our kids. Uh, one of the more popular ones is tangible schedules, and there are actually a number of, a, a number of different ways you can implement a tangible schedule in a classroom or at home. But essentially what a tangible schedule is, is a, a schedule that takes into account symbols or takes into account a, uh, a, a, class, a, a symbol that really teaches a child to that this is coming up at a specific time. You know, for example, you might have a, a pencil or, or, a, or a particular or a picture or the sound of a teacher's voice that might represent school. And this is going to happen when you go to school uh, this is going to happen between 8 and 8.30. You're going to ride to school. You, you go to school, you will be picked up at the bus stop, you will go to a classroom. This happens between 8.30 and 8.45, circled, and, and then comes circle time, and then comes uh, 
uh, classroom or, or pull-up for occupational therapy or speech therapy. And oftentimes that is done by means of, of what's referred to as a tangible schedule. And that can be done via uh, tactile schedules that there are a number of uh, that there are a number of scheduling systems uh, via Velcro, via uh, Braille schedules for their, or, or auditory skills that are musically based, but that's t typically musically based schedules are something that we typically don't recommend because a lot of our kids fixate on music, they don't, they don't focus on the, the beeping or, or the sound of a voice or what have you as opposed to uh, that particular schedule. Uh, for more information on tangible schedules, you can visit a number of resources on the web. Uh, the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. There is a psychologist by the name of Therese Paletko who does a lot of work with tangible schedules, actually written an article that you can certainly get some ideas for implementing a, ta a tangible schedule, a tactual schedule for somebody who is blind or visually impaired. And that can really, and What's really important in developing a tactual schedule is the learning preferences or, or the learning styles of a child. And that can vary from one context to another. But typically, a, a child has a primary learning media, be it in Braille, which can be more of a visual style, visual tactual style. Uh, a, a child can be like me, for example. And I was more of a primary and auditory learner. so what would work, what would have worked for me, or what typically works for me, are musical interests, or, or sounds of voices, or I was a huge ear reader at school. I used books on tape. I used materials from the Library of Congress, uh, National Library Service, and uh, there is an agency referred to as Recording for the Blind that is still being used that had books on audio tape. They have my textbooks on audio tape that's still available. I use more of those types of resources where a lot of kids, if they can process it, use Braille. They may need a picture schedule, they may need more textually based or Braille based schedules, uh, which is awesome. Uh, they, uh, there are children who process more visually, who have better usable vision, who use more visually based schedules. So that, that can really, and, and it varies from one child to the next, and there are a number of very a lot more comprehensive resources that, that I can get into on tangible schedules. Other types of supports are uh, augmented communication, as I discussed earlier, uh, speech and language. Uh, a lot of kids don't process verbally. A lot of kids are, are, are nonverbal, so uh, augmentative devices and there are a number of those on the market that are available. Uh, the, the speech language, but there a speech language a staff person, a speech language uh, a pathologist, or speech language therapist can recommend. Autism related interventions, uh, social stories. Social stories are, a, it is basically a narrative form that was developed by a uh, therapist by the name of Carol Gray in 1996 that teaches a child a specific context such as, say for example, please and thank you why it is important to say please and thank you, and it spells out uh, what what is appropriate for me to do and what is not appropriate for me to do, and what are uh, what are sets of alternative behaviors that are socially inappropriate versus socially uh, uh, socially acceptable behaviors. Social stories work for a lot of kids. For me, they typically. It, it is something that needs to be individualized for one child or another. I typically am sort of a fan of social stories personally because in my context I, I had a lot of uh, sort of rules and regulations that I used. I actually did consider going to law school at one point. So I had a lot of rules and, and regulations and, and a constitution that I developed when I was in sixth grade to manage behaviors that had different articles and different regulations and there were different uh, uh, there were different uh, presidents and different acts that came out of that constitution, had specific dates and those are those are typically things that can be converted into social into a, a typical social story format relatively easily. So I typically recommend social stories, but social stories and other types of interventions or supports or strategies
these are, are strategies that are, that typically are used or in many cases are used but you have to understand the child's developmental history and you also have to understand that a child may be engaging in behaviors for a number of reasons they may they may be having a meltdown they may be having a crying episode or they may uh, be hitting or becoming physically aggressive toward another child, a peer, a classmate, or, or you as a family member, or a teacher, or their aide, because of uh, something that is medically going on. They may be in legitimate need of intervention from the school nurse, or they may be having an adrenal crisis, or they may be in a, a situation where they're overstimulated. Another type of intervention that is very typical of uh, uh, our kids it is referred to as a sensory diet and a sensory diet is done under the supervision of an occupational therapist and that is a a setup by which a child has the opportunity to take a scheduled break or be able to uh, go to a, a given place during the school uh, during the school day or every uh, X amount of time, which is prescribed by an occupational therapist, and essentially decompress for five minutes or three minutes or a, a given amount of activity. Because sometimes kids with their one age, they, they need to be able to process, they need to be able to understand or, or to engage in certain activities in order to process what is going on in their environment. You look at behaviors, I, all the behaviors that I discuss, such as echolalia, uh, such as your uh, self-stimulatory self behaviors, rocking, hand flapping, eye pressing, those types of behaviors. We don't engage in any of these types of behaviors. Meltdown, what I used to do is, is sit up and cry. Uh, what a lot of kids do is they will they, they may physically become aggressive, they may act out, they may bolt from the school, they may take off and run, and, and they're found, they may find, be found a mile away. And in some of these behaviors are, in many cases, in some cases, involuntary behaviors. The, the child might not be in a position where they're able to realize what they're doing necessarily 100% of the time. So having the opportunity to be able to take a break or, or decompress or make sense of their environment through what's referred to as a sensory diet can be absolutely critical. There are cases in, in behavior such as rocking. I, I know I've done this a couple of times. I've had reoccurrences of, of rocking behaviors as an adult where sometimes it may be necessary for the kid to go off in, in, in her bedroom. I cer I've certainly done it and rock or uh, engage in, in rhythmic self stimulating behaviors. It's not something I'm proud of. It's not something I'm hoping I'm doing now during this presentation, but it has happened in, in my case and it will happen with our kids, uh, with any of your kids. And that said, given the uh, given some of the developmental and educational strategies, I'm going to just very briefly before I wrap things up and, and conclude, uh, I, I typically get refer get asked this many times. Uh, I want to discuss or give you the opportunity to understand. Well, you know, he's talked about all this behaviors and and all this. Uh, you know, all this mumbo jumbo about proprioception and interception and da 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 da. I've been talking for two hours now. But how did you manage your own behaviors? This is a question I get asked many times. And to be brutally honest with you, behavior management is an ongoing process for me. And it is still something that I am a hundred percent do not do a hundred percent of the time. I still have behaviors. Uh, I still have uh, some difficulty managing a hundred percent of the time. Uh, I 
have dealt with a reoccurrence, for example, of, of rocking behaviors. I was actually terminated from a job as a state vocational rehabilitation counselor due to uh, some uh, demanding behaviors due to some uh, case where I was actually rocking in my office. There was another case where I kept a technical support staff person from our IT department at our central office on the phone for two hours trying to resolve an issue that was basically having to do with printing uh, labels on a an HP printer that was connected to a network in our office. And I got completely frustrated and uh, focused and uh, actually became very demanding. Actually, it was the same situation with Microsoft. Uh, you, uh, same deal. You actually do not want to put me in a, con in, a, in a situation where I'm dealing with Microsoft technical support because you'll get an instant meltdown, obviously, especially with these behaviors, especially if they're offshore. So that said, understand, I'm mentioning all these things personally because behavior management is a discipline, it's, an, it's a discipline effort, it's day to day. You know, it's no different than if you have diabetes, being able to manage insulin, being able to manage, uh, uh, being able to keep track of your uh, your blood sugar, your glucose levels, so they don't spike, so you don't, you don't end up in a diabetic coma, that there are, or, or other complications. You know, it's no different than if you have another type of physical disability or medical condition that you know constant pain that needs to be managed or another type of congenital disorder that needs to be managed via medication. I can tell you right now that I work at home. If I had to leave and work in an office setting, I probably would need to go on medication for behaviors, uh, psycho uh, psychotropic medication, you know, which is fine because a lot of children, a lot of adults uh, require mood stabilizers or other medications just to function, unfortunately, just, just the way our society is set up. So all of that said, all of this preamble was said, all of this preamble said, I want, uh, I wanted to just mention earlier how I found that I needed to be able to manage behaviors growing up. I had eight years of occupational therapy. I had eight years of speech therapy and other supports growing up. I also attended three years of pretty intensive daily living skills, travel skills, orientation mobility through an agency that specializes in rehabilitation of blind children and adults. And at that point in time, this is in the 80s, this agency provided residential support. It provided uh, residential programming and it, it had uh, housing for uh, consumers. The housing was actually uh, demolished in the early 90s, but their services were in existence. And uh, that is why I learned most of the daily living skills that I have to this day. Everything from how to tie my shoe, the 30th anniversary of my ability to learn how to tie my shoe was actually this month. It was August 1988 that I learned how to tie my shoes. And it was about this time that I understood my parents, of course, and everybody was, you know, saying, well, you need to stop rocking, you need to be more, you know, you, you, you stop doing this, stop doing that. And managing behaviors was a huge struggle, managing areas of interest that I had, uh, be it uh, teachers, be it, uh, you know, sound of people's voices, be it musical preferences I had that were not the norm for uh, other children, other, other kids my age need to be managed and there were times when I was growing up as a child particularly in adolescence where that was a very brutal process. You know, adolescence is very difficult for a lot of kids but for me it was it was a it was a brutal process because it was really for me it was a lot of developmental catch up. There were areas that other kids had mastered when they were three and four years old. I was still learning. And it was the same pretty much all through grade school and all through high school and particularly after I learned to tie my shoe and after I learned it and started to really learn a lot of you know more basic skills in junior high and high school I became aware that I wanted to fit in but at the same time 
there were cases where I needed to be blind and I needed to learn blindness skills and I needed to be able to function in a situation that was more commensurate or more along the lines of what my own needs were as opposed to my peers. We lived in an area that was uh, that was removed from the uh, public transit. We, there was really wasn't a lot of uh, transportation where I lived. Uh, we lived in a fairly well-to-do school district. Actually, we had uh, one of the best school districts in the state of Ohio in a lot of areas. Uh, fortunately, we weren't very athletic. We had a lot of uh, ethnic diversity. We had a uh, uh, Procter & Gamble was actually the main employer here in Cincinnati, and we had several uh, technical sites. A, a lot of a lot of kids that I went to school with had families and parents who worked with Procter and & Gamble and Merrill Dow, Merrill Dow and places like that. So you had a lot of very educated uh, families. You had a lot of people with uh, technical backgrounds, with uh, professional backgrounds and what have you, a lot of parents in, in that sphere. So it wasn't, so a lot of, and it was also because it was a well-to-do school, we had a lot of clicks, we had a lot of clickism, uh, like everywhere, but it was particularly, it seemed, uh, apparent uh, why I went to school. Uh, so it, it was a lot of difficulty fitting in, and I realized when I was about in eighth grade, I actually, when I finished my third year of programming at the summer program, why I attended for three years. I was given our community, I was given the final report on my progress and they finally started to realize I was having all this difficulty with basic skills that other blind children, other blind people who were in the program I was in, who did not have optic nerve hyperplasia, had a lot more difficulty in learning these skills than uh, most of the other kids I went to went to this program with, and I, even I knew uh, by this time that, because I went to school with a lot of blind kids, I, I went to a program for preschool that was for a visually impaired, it was for uh, kids who were blind and visually impaired, and I still know these guys to this day, I grew up with these guys, as well as the, uh, uh, the program at, at the Center for the Blind while I was in the summer school. I knew that I was had had a lot more difficulty in these areas that uh, than, than other kids who were pretty much normal, but they just happened to be blind. And uh, the final report from my third year of uh, the summer programming basically said, "Okay, look, you, there's all these difficulties. He he can't regulate. He's having all trouble. He's having all this trouble with cooking and you know, learning how to." Manipulate objects is a real struggle. A lot of mechanical skills are, are a struggle. Fine motor and social, uh, fine motor and gross motor skills were a struggle. Social appropriate, uh, being, uh, uh, not being socially awkward, that, that was a huge struggle. Because I still had musical preferences I was trying to manage and, and, and those types of issues at that point. And I knew that I had to be appropriate, being or, or acceptable and presentable to peers and, and adults and what have you. But I realized that in order to do these, in order to be presentable, in order to fit in and please my family, ultimately, I had to manage my behaviors and I had to have more insight into my behaviors. And when I, my parents read me this report. I can still give you the date. Uh, it was August 24th, 1988, the 30th anniversary as this date is actually coming up uh, later this week, in fact. Uh, I remember my mom reading me this article about, it. I believe this might have been with aging errors. It was a very old article on, it was one of the original articles on sensory integration disorder. They finally decided, they were finally begin, beginning to understand that a lot of these trouble, a lot of these difficulties with self-regulation are related to sensory processing or sensory integration. We're finally under, coming to that conclusion. We really didn't know what autism was or what sensory integration was. Uh, this was the year, this was the exact year that the film Rain Man had come out. So my mom was reading me this article on sensory processing and 
she read me about she read me a a case summary of a young man who had been in an institution that she would she did a lot of work in institutions and this was a young man who when he when he screamed, when he turned a certain way, when he made left-hand turns, he was extremely dizzy. He screamed, and he was very upset, and he was very dizzy, and there were a number of other types of behaviors that this 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 guy exhibited. That was in this case summary. I remember one of one of the things in particular that was mentioned was that he focused on irrelevant details. Now, at this time, one of my big things was uh, areas of interest was the periodic table and elements and radioactivity and isotopes and atomic numbers and whatnot. I actually learned to recite the periodic table up to element 103, up to Laurentium at the time. I actually learned how to do this when I was uh, the, the spring of my eighth grade year, just, just basically just, just for simulation. And I would constantly ask, well, can you believe I can recite the periodic table? And I would ask that constantly. I think a lot of it was a, you know, just stimulation, but it was also something I was constantly receiving, constantly asking for praise or feedback. And my mom basically said, well, can you, I would constantly ask this. And she was like, well, yeah. And she cited that just, just as a number of examples of situations where I would focus on something that was irrelevant or talk out of turn or what have you. Well, what was people didn't understand because sighted people typically all all they can the, the only knowledge base that they have is uh, observing what a, a an adult or a child how they interact and their understanding was that okay, this kid is talking out of turn or focusing on Irrelevant details, but in so I understood. Okay, I, I had to focus on not focusing on in on irrelevant details. Well, when I figured out figured out how to fo not focus on irrelevant details and to stop rocking and minimize my behaviors, or ultimately extinguish or stop my behaviors, I noticed something interesting. I noticed that these behaviors or these uh, irrelevancies, if you were, errors in my thinking fell into discrete, specific categories. And in these, these categories and the, these types of feelings that I had or impulses to engage in certain behaviors and the, the, the spirit of the regulations and, and all the stuff that I developed in the past, I actually gave these categories names. And I actually referred to many of them as thought strains. I actually had two different types of categories. One of them was thought strain. The other one was uh, what I referred to as a Jersey mechanism because Jersey, at the time I was, uh, fascinated with towns in northern New Jersey because that was an area code that was fascinating and for various reasons. So yeah, I referred to these as thought strains. And the reason I referred to them as thought strains was because they, they reminded me uh, when I was uh, looking inside of myself and I was figuring out how these things interacted like strains of a virus, which I'll get into a little bit later. And uh, the strains of, of a virus. So you basically, what would happen was, when I developed it, when I finally figured out, okay, there's a category of behavior that is associated with rocking, with, with doing this kind of behavior. I actually had two types of behavior, two types of rocking behavior. One of them was the uh, the the back and forth rocking, which was something I used to do constantly, and it was very stimulating. Actually, I needed the stimulation. But I also engaged in, in this kind of behavior as well, which was also more of a side-to-side uh, -side movement, and it, which was like this. And that was a, a different strain, actually, of rocking, a different type of rocking that I had developed. I, I realized I was engaging in, or knew I was engaging in. So with that behavior, what I learned to do, and I noticed in kids that do this, is I actually 
started a program by which I would only allow myself to rock a certain number of times or engage in that behavior a certain number of times a day. And originally it was, I think it was 500 times a day. And so the first day, I would start out with 500 rocks, 500 iterations, 500 repetitions at behavior. Okay, so the next day I would taper it down to 490. And next day after that, it was 480. And the next day after that, it was 470 and so on and so forth. I forget what the exact count was. And it wasn't that systematic, but it was basically started, it basically was a matter of gradually tapering off that behavior. And what I uh, eventually, that is how I st was able to stop rocking and hand flapping, flapping my hands, which is like this, during a school day, which was a, considered a, a socially inappropriate behavior. To understand too, one thing I didn't get into in, in a lot of kids, a lot of kids don't need that kind of, of discipline because the behaviors weren't that difficult to, uh, to extinguish. Uh, in, in my case, they actually tried to redirect me from these behaviors by using uh, squeeze balls and other types of sensory activities, mainly squeeze balls, squeezing a ball. But one of the things that I noticed with using a squeeze ball and, and using other types of, of stress relievers was that uh, they didn't give me the stimulation I needed that the inappropriate behavior that rocking gave me. For example, if, if I needed... 20 points, if I need 100 points of stimulation, and I can get that from rocking or, and, and flapping my hands, that's going to give me 100 points of stimulation. Using a squeeze ball is only going to get me 15 points of stimulation, so I need 85 points of stimulation, and I'm going to get that wherever possible. So I have no incentive to stop engaging in the behavior without other supports internally. And what I found in, in working with a lot of kids is sometimes in, when you deal with behaviors such as rocking or hand flapping, oftentimes you need an interdisciplinary approach and that's what people don't understand or really don't realize. Sometimes you need occupational therapy, uh, behavior therapy, and in a few cases, in many cases, medication. I call it the sweet like it's stool. And I, I didn't have access to medication so it was pretty much sink or swim. So that was how I by tapering off that behavior gradually, that's how I learned to stop rocking and stop flapping my hand. But here is but, but one of the things that's interesting that you need to understand, I think, is that these behaviors didn't just go away overnight. And they actually led to stopping or curtailing rocking and hand flapping actually led to some other behaviors that were less appropriate, that were maybe less unacceptable, but were still unacceptable. But it's still unacceptable and they still were behaviors I needed to engage in because I still had trouble with sensory processing and one of the behaviors that I would engage in is I used to do this I used to tap my hands very very vigorously and, and at very high speed and that was actually became for about a year a year and a half going into high school was a substitute for rocking and hand flapping and one of the reasons why I actually came up with the term strain or thought strain or impulse strain to describe these behaviors or more directly the impulses that I had to engage in these behaviors is because that, that happens in a lot of cases would be in areas of interest, be it musical areas of interest or, or what have you. Uh, they, they tended to not just go away, that they tended to mutate like a, a strain of a virus. And they tended to evolve into more adaptive impulses that, that were like other strains that mutated. They were like strains of, of a given behavior, but they were still inappropriate. They were still weren't accessible. They were still weren't acceptable. Uh, I've seen this in the autism community too, with, with kids, they might be obsessed on trains or a war of 1812 or something like that. And with interventions, a lot of cases, they may have applied behavior analysis or they may have some other intervention or they may uh, be 
forcing themselves to interact uh, more acceptably or, or more uh, acceptable fashion with, with uh, their, their kids or on age or peers. But what happens is that the tendency to obsess doesn't just go away. Uh, I, I've seen kids, that, that I've heard of kids, for example, that instead of the War of 1812, they may obsess on something like, it might evolve into something like the Cincinnati Reds or uh, NASCAR or, or something that might be a little more uh, acceptable. But they're still obsessing, and that certainly happened with me. I actually, I mentioned New Jersey earlier, that northern New Jersey, well, there's a couple of reasons why I obsessed on that for about a year. And one of them was, New Jersey was actually the first area code, 201, was northern New Jersey. And it wasn't, cent it was also, it wasn't South Jersey, it was, wasn't like Atlantic City or what have you. It was only towns and counties within what was originally the 201 area code of central and northern New Jersey. That would be places like, for those of you who are able to go from there, would be places like Newark and Jersey City and New Brunswick and uh, Phillipsburg, uh, the Pennsylvania line, for example, where the Delaware River was, and uh, the, the, some a lot of the uh, uh, you know, Jersey Shore communities like Seaside Heights and Freehold and Asbury Park and places like that that were in that 201 zone, 201 area code, if you will. But 609 Atlantic City, Camden, uh, South Jersey, uh, Salem, Freehold, uh, I, I could care less about places like that, essentially, because it was 609, they weren't part of that area code. I had this area of interest for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was a telephone area code, but there was also a, a social component to it because, or what I was noticing, was a lot of kids were moving to and from northern New Jersey because of, you know, particularly Merrill Dow, the pharmaceutical in industry. There was a lot of comings and goings, kids moving from where I went to school here in Cincinnati, where I operate to and from. Uh, back and forth between, especially in Bergen County, places like that in, in Jersey. So that was, sort of became an area of interest uh, for that very reason. And that sort of became a transition period, if you will, from being in my own world and, and being in my own universe, if you will, and, and, uh, and, and, and being more interactive and being more engaged. And I kind of went through a period uh, of that. So that is essentially how I learned to engage. And I also had other areas of interest that were had to do with asking irrelevant details that I found had certain categories. Uh, that it would be associated, like, like for example, I might ask for something I would associate with something else. And I can't give you examples right now. But the one I can think of off the top is I used to be, at, at that time, I used to ask how old everybody was. Uh, I actually referred this as an age-based association. It, I actually gave a, a specific name, and that had a mechanism associated to it. I had mechanisms for uh, uh, communicating with teachers, communicating with uh, older adult relatives as opposed to peers my own age. And uh, I, I had one of the behaviors I, I have extreme difficulty managing even to this day is demanding an out grit and tooth and do this. And I actually have a name for that behavior. I call it Parsippany. And uh, this is very, uh, this is a, a very uh, individualized term. I've only used this a couple of times uh, to describe that behavior. But it's very difficult to manage. One of the things that I have figured out is that whenever I engage in these behaviors, unfortunately, uh, to this day, some of these aren't 100%, I would convert the behavior, or re first of all, I would recognize, oh, this is this is such and such a behavior, that this is a, a mechanism that I, I need to manage, it's not appropriate, it's not acceptable, but it's also categorically not an acceptable behavior. I, I have something that I call a categorically irrational or categorically unacceptable behavior. And usually when, it, and that usually refers to a category or, or a specific impulse that by definition is not going to lead to an acceptable behavior. So I used to, and still do to some extent, uh, 
if I have an impulse to engage in a behavior such as uh, uh, you know, such as rocking, I might convert that into a sound or a a, a, a mental stimulus that I would uh, I would use inside of my head. I, I actually might think of a a phaser on Star Trek, Star Trek because I was a big Star Trek fan at that point. Whenever I would have an impulse to rock, for example, I would engage. I would have a a sound like a phaser going off, and a different and different sounds. Whenever I wanted to ask something that was inappropriate or that was private or what have you, that was another type of impulse, and I I might uh, convert that into a sound that I would. Uh, uh, obviously, I, I wouldn't articulate these sounds out loud, but they would be inside of my head. So I would, that would be, a, another impulse would be uh, a gun going off, a gunshot, or police sirens were very typical. Klaxons, uh, air raid sirens were actually very typical. Uh, it, it, would, it would go, boop, boop, uh, tricorder sound from, from Star Trek uh, was actually a very common sound that I would convert an impulse in, into a sound, and it would sort of neutralize my need to engage in a behavior. So it would neutralize in the, the impulse. But typically, when you do, the whole process of understanding or being able to manage my own behaviors, it takes a lot of a tremendous amount of insight, uh, which I understand a, a lot of kids do have a lot of difficulty with uh, for for various reasons, but. I do believe that uh, kids can develop you know, through practice, through discipline, and, and what have you. But I will tell you, it took a lot of discipline, it took a lot of resources, and it took a tremendous amount of willpower in my case, in my part, to be able to manage uh, these behaviors and develop a schema for managing them. And it's also important that when, when you typically look at impulse management, from my perspective, there is a difference, there's actually in some cases a big difference between managing an impulse to engage in a behavior and managing the behavior. Because basically when you're managing the behavior, you're often using reward or, or punishment or, or positive, uh, you know, some type of positive behavioral support. You, you may need to uh, uh, constantly uh, praise or, or give uh uh, tokens to a child who's being good, who's able to manage, but the impulse, but the process of managing that behavior is, is quite a different. It, it, it is is quite a different uh, kettle of fish when you deal with uh, uh, being able to understand that behaviors. And sometimes it has sometimes managing behaviors understand uh, means managing impulses to engage in such behaviors, and using strategies internally to fend them off and. That's something I used to refer to as impulse command and control or impulse management. Uh, this is an old term I used to develop these. So my whole point in mentioning this is, is uh, it, it, and this can get very, tech, very technical and very personal and very private. And if people have any questions or comments or uh, areas that they want to discuss with me or, or need things explained to them, I would definitely... Uh, encourage you to reach out to me because it's, it can get very uh, difficult to explain. I try to explain much of this as, as best I can because as a family, as an educator, as a, a resource person or someone in the community that has worked with our kids, it, you need to understand, I believe, as much of this as possible. And also for those of you who are dealing with children that have endocrine dysfunction or other medical complications, a lot of times when a child is engaging in behaviors, there may be a medical component to that. And that child may be crying out for help. And sometimes the only way that a child is able to articulate what they're feeling and the fact that they need help is by either engaging in behaviors or using internal dialogue like made-up words or neologisms that they use, which is the reason I was somewhat liberal with uh, discussing my own neologisms in the last installment of my presentation because you need to understand a lot of kids that they may need to understand or that they may need to articulate, that they may need a, a doctor number. And, and one of our kids, we used to, when he was 
uh, uh, we found out that when he was slipping into an adrenal crisis, he would ask for doctor number 40, I believe it was, because that was a feeling that he, that was a, uh, uh, a, a, a state that he had, that he had assigned to doctor number 40, and it turned out that he would, he would ask for that doctor just because, just before he would start showing physical symptoms of a, an adrenal crisis and maybe need to be talking, maybe needed to lie down or, or needed uh, fluids or uh, ultimately a, a solar cord of injection because he was having an adrenal crisis. And also understand too that there are, when you deal with impulses and a lot of my stuff, there is a normal fatigue and then there are the impulses to engage in behaviors and those are entirely different balls of wax. I mean, a child can be tired, they may be dragged out, or they may uh, feel like totally, you know what, and that may be a, a normal thing, that may be a normal context, but if they ask for something like Dr. 40, or in my case, they're experiencing a, uh, uh, or, or they're, they're dealing with uh, uh, a need to engage, or they're having foreign systems, which is a, an area which is basically a, a particular desire to uh, have access to an areas of interest, that was a term that I would apply to music. There was wanting something and then there was having a foreign system for a an area of interest like uh, uh, musical, like music, like the Carpenters, for example, was an area of interest that actually would trigger foreign systems in my case. And those states are entirely, two entirely separate kettles of fish. And uh, there is wanting something in a normal context and uh, having that other experience that is not a, a typical experience, that is something that's related to my own context. And if any of you need an explanation, I just feel free to reach out to me because that's pretty much the only way I can explain uh, these types of things in a typical sense. I did mention that uh, earlier that a lot of our kids perceive, have a very gestalt or a very holistic way of processing information. And it can actually make teaching concepts or, or reading comprehension or learning different skills very difficult, if not impossible, in, in some cases without support. And this all ties into a lot of those gestalts and certainly feel free to ex uh, seek explanations and reach out to me if you need this further clarified because it is very involved. I want to conclude my presentation by just mentioning that uh, a few things. First of all, understanding ONH or working with a child with ONH is a very involved process and it takes a community. It, it, ta it takes a village. To, if there's, a, if there's a, any group of kids where the saying it takes a village to raise a child applies, it is our kids. It is a child with ONH. It definitely takes a village to raise one of our, child, one of our kids be it uh, extended family, be it school, be it people in the community, be it uh, ancillary staff such as professionals, such as uh, doctors, such as uh, uh, speech language pathologists, speech language therapists, such as uh, uh, your, your vision services, your aides, what have you, all need to be on the same page. There's a kid that I work with that lived in a town in New England and just, just to give you a context, uh, I don't want to mention the name of the town specifically for confidentiality reasons, obviously, but it was a town that was featured in one of Stephen King's novels, a couple of Stephen King's novels, actually. It was in Maine, where part of the intervention, part of what, part of what they wanted to do was have the entire town, it was a small town, just to think of Steve, for any of you who are Stephen King fans, a lot of what... Uh, a lot of his novels took place in small towns in Maine. They wanted to have everybody in the small town, everything from the corner grocer to the uh, the, the hairdresser, the, the barber, to everybody in the school, everybody in this district involved in what do you do when, when you meet this child. Her name was Abby, actually. And he she actually had some other types of developmental disabilities. I, I don't think that she was supported as well as uh, uh, we would like. She ended up in a uh, more of a segregated classroom environment. But they wanted to make essentially the town, the entire town, a therapeutic environment for this kid. 
which is absolutely wonderful. And I think it is something that needs to be done more often. I would definitely encourage uh, anyone to do. Uh, definitely, it also, one of the things that I find lacking and is absolutely critical is uh, individuals, is teachers, other staff, speech, language, autism professionals, medical professionals, be it the school nurse, uh, be it uh, doctors that are working with that child, need to be on the same page. And there's no collaboration. And oftentimes in school, there is no cross-disciplinary collaboration, which is absolutely critical for our kids. Uh, you have teachers that are visually impaired, for example, that are teaching Braille, but have no clue what a lot of the facets of living with autism or teaching a child who is on the autism spectrum are well about. And autism characteristics can be the, in some cases, the, the greatest barrier to learning Braille, for teaching a child Braille who has optic nerve hypoplasia, if they're tactually defensive, or if they have other types of, of tactual discrimination issues or processing quirks or processing difficulties, they may need support from the autism community or an occupational therapist because those are the main barriers to that child learning Braille. And oftentimes there's no communication. The autism community doesn't know Braille or what a blind person needs to go through in order to learn Braille. And yet the teachers are visually impaired who are oftentimes the ones that teach Braille don't know autism. They don't know sensory processing difficulties or communication difficulties. And oftentimes what you get in in total is the kid in Colorado I was mentioning to you earlier where they finally decided, uh, threw up their hands and said, well, we can't teach this child Braille. But unfortunately, uh, when, when, when what's really needed is we need to step up this child's intervention to learn Braille as opposed to just throwing in a towel and, and denying the kid's services. And, and in a way, that actually happened with me, except I was able to learn Braille as an adolescent and adult, once I reached a certain point as far as my sensory integration, once I learned some prerequisite skills. Which finally leads to my last point, and hopefully, it, for, for those of you who have uh, sat, there for, sat there for four hours listening to this presentation from one section to the next to the next, straight through, if there's anything that I want you to remember from this presentation is we will test you. We will, in some cases, make you question your ability to parent or teach or uh, manage our, our behaviors. We will basically drive you absolutely crazy. But when all is said and done, assume that we can learn. Assume that we can process. Assume that we can be taught and assume that we can thrive. That concludes my workshop. This concludes my presentation. Thank you.